Hi, it's Eliana here at Awakening Cosmic Reality Show, and I have Randy Noel today with me. Randy and I had done a hypnosis session about his memories from Mars and the moon. Uh, he has had interesting SSP experiences. Welcome, Randy. Oh, uh, thank you, Eliana. Thanks for having me on your show. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. I appreciate and uh, thanks a lot for your on. session uh, recently. Uh, you really like, uh, you know, blew my mind in a very positive way. Yeah. So you've, um, before we had the session, you sent me a few questions that you were interested in looking at through hypnosis. So would you like to describe what you already remembered? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, well, definitely. And I had a, a memory since then as well. Uh, but, uh, oh, you mean, what, should I go through a little bit about the actual memories uh, that I was... Uh, uh, you were helping with me with the other yes. day? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, cool. Well, let's see the, I just started having, I had like actually four memories this year now um, of uh, basically three of them were on Mars, working on Mars. And the other one was, uh, from what I can see, I definitely came off as a, what we call a shuttle ship. And so I was, we were in dress uniform, so to speak. And so I uh, wasn't working that day. We were traveling. Like, so I, I have a feeling that memory was, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure, uh, boarding a shuttle, going from the, uh, from the moon to Mars. That was the feelings I had. And, of, uh, of, and then uh, uh, that came, you know, sort of information packets with the visual memory as well. But the first, um, yeah, the first memory I had early this year uh, was, let's see, it was, that was the third one. Then there was the, uh, uh, oh yeah, the, um, oh, okay, yeah, the first memory I had was patrolling through um, pine forests on Mars, a couple of memories of that, and uh, I definitely remember it as being, it looks like, uh, I could tell it's, it's their pine trees or pine-like, and uh, for sure, you know, um, like we see on Earth. And it, it, it looked like, like what we see a pine plantation that was planted either by hand or we use the machines here and stuff because they were so evenly distributed, the trees. Um, and then I'm thinking after, well, maybe they just sort of grew that way somehow because Mars is pretty harsh eh, on the, uh, the surface. Uh, I certainly uh, at times just, to, just somehow so they could get a protection uh, grow so that they could protect themselves better but that doesn't make that I, I see that that doesn't make sense now and some information i from you it fits that yeah it, these uh pine forests were uh planted uh by us the humans um but it looks like it's probably been planted with a more advanced technology than what we use here you know uh we got the we got the planting machine so to speak but we hand plant a lot too and stuff eh Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so when we looked at your memories, it looked like it was regenerated. These pine-like forests were regenerated through terraformation technology. So like you said, it wasn't hand-planted. It was, there's something to do with the soil on Mars, where everything just grows much larger than what's on Earth. So that's what we looked at in the hypnosis session. And we also, when we went in into your memories, we saw that there's huge mushrooms as well near these pine forests. So. Oh, huge mushrooms. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so. I, yeah. I didn't uh, notice those yet. Like I don't, I, I don't remember seeing them yeah. uh, at, at yet. Anyways, hey, that's very interesting though. I hope I can remember some of that. These, you know, very large mushrooms throughout these forests apparently. Eh? Yeah. Well, when I was walking um, in the hypnosis session through your memories with me, because I was walking with you, I mm -hmm. noticed the huge pine trees and I noticed the mushrooms beside them, like these huge brown red mushrooms. Cool, and cool. They look like they're edible, but they're huge. So it would be <clears throat> average mushrooms we have are like this, and these guys are huge, bigger, and just as the pine trees themselves are much bigger, because there's something in the soil of Mars that's different, that it means things grow bigger. And these are like sanctuaries for terraformation of the pine trees. Cool. On the surface. Also too, oh sorry, I just want, yeah, I noticed to me they were taller for the size of pines than I'm uh, being accustomed to seeing here on Earth. 
Mm -hmm. You know, like say, so they, to me, they had grown taller than what they would have on earth at that yeah. stage of their life. These pine trees. Absolutely. Um, and it, wouldn't that also factor in the, uh, I believe it's about 0.6 gravity on the, the Mars surface compared to Earth? Like, as far as, you know, we say one gravity Earth here on at sea level or whatever. Isn't that, uh, so wouldn't that also uh, perhaps, uh, that's got to play a role, doesn't it, in grow, growth uh, of uh, foliage, trees, all that kind of stuff, eh? Yeah, indeed, because Mars is, I think, further away from the sun right than earth so mm -hmm. gravity does play a role in it but it's the soil composition of mars that's also different so the growth factor is much bigger for everything on that planet and when we looked at the, these memories of yours we noticed that there was about four to eight acres of these sanctuaries and there was about four to ten of them on mars from what i remember from the session itself Oh yeah, I, uh, I for some reason I got a feeling they're much larger than that. But uh, you know, I'll uh, I'll work on I'll begin to work on uh, expanding these memories and, and stuff now. Uh, you know, through meditation and all that. Uh, mm -hmm. Now that the sort of you know the doors are opening and the windows are opening up, uh, and I think that's really uh, we're going to see more and more of that on the Earth's surface by the peoples uh, for many reasons, uh, including uh, testimony from uh, uh, people in recent years. Uh, secret space program uh, veterans, uh, MK Ultra mind control uh, uh, experiencers. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to use the word victims and that or whatever, but uh, all kinds of these things that uh, we know go on, uh, and uh, many of us have experienced things uh, uh, in regards to uh, that are related and uh, directly related to, including being uh, uh, drafted into uh, a space program that still doesn't ex officially exist, uh, apparently, you know, that kind of thing. Eh? Yeah, and I mean, from your memories, when we looked at them, we discovered that you were a Kruger soldier that was commissioned to patrol these terraformation sanctuaries to protect them from the reptilians burning them down. Wow, yeah, really, I, uh, like you say, that, that, yeah, that was surprising to hear that. It, you know, it, 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 it has some, uh, uh, it, 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 you know, it's not, it, it can make sense or anything. Because uh, uh, I guess, I think like you were explaining, yeah, the reptilians, perhaps uh, they could thrive more on arid, more type uh, 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 climates and such. And same with the insectoids, I would imagine, compared to the mammals and all that and the human and other mammals. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that was surprising to hear that though. That well, why would anybody want to burn down these beautiful forests, kind of thing? Eh? Yeah, because uh, they do it here on Earth too. So you know, there's you know, there's criminality uh, kind of thing. Uh, it's a different, uh, whole different story. But anyways, yeah, that's uh, very interesting. Uh, when uh, I was hearing that from you, Liliana, as well. Yeah, because the reptilians are used to the aridness of Mars, where they are. Mm. So for them, that's comfortable. But uh, what Mars Defense Force? Um, what Kruger and other factions are trying to introduce is more oxygenation to Mars, and that's through these trees. So mm -hmm. to um, build a thicker atmosphere, to rebuild the oxygenation in the atmosphere. So that's why they're um, building these sanctuaries of these forests on the surface. They're not even covered by biodomes anymore, because usually anything they put, like forests, lakes, that's um, covered by these huge biodomes. So all everything is within a controlled environment for, for, for nature and stuff on Mars in the colonies. So this is outside these colonies. This is on this, this is not protected by any biodome because they want to introduce plant life back into the surface. Exactly. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. You want to yeah. It's got to be able to fly. It's got to be able to be part of the main atmosphere and not you know sort of uh, under a uh, a uh, produced sort of synthetically produced uh, uh, environment, so to speak. Uh, yeah. The um, because I mean that's it's awesome to hear that 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 that, that is in a sense of it, it. It I think on in a bigger picture, regardless of maybe groups may not want that. Uh, I think uh, generally uh, to terraform, completely re-terraform Mars eventually is is what is the right thing to do for many reasons. Uh, and uh, I think that'll probably happen. It's going to take some time, obviously. 
it'll never be the, quite the same. Like, you, you know, you plant a pine forest is excellent, but it's, you know, it's not like what you see then a naturally uh, evolved forest. Well, that's, that's uh, not quite the right word, but where there's tends to be more diversity in regards to trees and such, and it'll tend to even uh, uh, support more life when you have a, you know, a so-called natural forest with various trees and, and foliage shrubs and everything eh? but it's yeah. still it's awesome it's a uh, pine forests are awesome uh and uh that was yeah it, it, a little bit more of that memory was yeah i remember patrolling uh on on one case down a dirt road and then another time patrolling down a, a paved road that was about twice as wide as the dirt road and tree like rows of trees on each side all pine trees pine like trees pine trees uh, yeah, evenly spaced apart like a, plant, a, a pine plantation we see here on Earth. Uh, and we are definitely in a light armored uh, personnel, car uh, personnel carrier, so to speak. Not, uh, it wasn't an APC like a grizzly or something. It was certainly uh, a light uh, armored personnel uh, vehicle. You know, like uh, something, uh, probably not quite, but it might even, you know, kind of like those Hummers you see that the military strengthens to make military grade, and, and you see the militaries use the Hummers on the Earth's surface. Uh, but I just wanted to mention that because these memories I find interesting. I didn't see that vehicle we're in, but I knew we were in a vehicle, and I knew it wasn't, you know, a tank or, or a uh, an armored personnel carrier. It was a light, you know, uh, one of those what we call a light armored personnel carrier uh vehicle uh so to speak eh? yes and uh you also remember battling reptilians oh yes uh that was the second memory um and um uh that was in regards to yeah i had two memories so far of in the field fighting uh um uh, draconian warriors I figure they're about average, about seven feet tall. Although these, both these memories were just one, myself and and the war, uh, the the draconian. And in one case, uh, I had a plasma sword, and uh, we're engaged, so we're obviously very close to each other. And I, uh, uh, my with the plasma sword, I, I I cut off half his snout, so to speak, because what I saw both from those draconians, they looked just like. Um, Captain Randy Kramer has described the Draconians when he was ba he's battled them on Mars, uh, you know, heads on them, just like a crocodile here on Earth, like, just like it, you know. Uh, to me, you put the, the head of the Draconian, the crocodile, and the, the Draconian's big tail together, you pretty well got uh, what we see crocodiles here, eh? mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Obviously, the DNA, like, you know, crocodiles and Draconians, uh, there's a DNA friggin' uh, match going on there, so to speak. So that was, yeah, with a, one of, a plasma sword. Uh, some people call it that. Um, I think I've heard you call it a crystal sword. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'd like, yeah, let's call it a crystal sword. That's a cool name for it. So, yeah, but a plasma technology. It wasn't like you explained. Uh, I've heard you talk about plasma swords. This one, to me, didn't have any steel or anything, absolutely. It was just uh, designed with an energy field, a plasma energy field, uh, and it didn't expand out, uh, you know, uh, like I've seen, I think in Star Wars, it goes really long, the beam and all that. And so, uh, but it was a, it was definitely a plasma technology uh, yeah. from what I uh, gathered anyways. Yeah, and you also had experiences on the moon where when we looked at the memories, the reptilians trained you um, to, to, they have a base on the moon where they do psionics training. So mm -hmm. they do levitation and physical fighting and stuff, but they had taken you to train you um with psionics but there's uh, a apparently base. apparently uh yeah that was uh yeah like like you're saying and that one very vivid experience uh i was mentioning to you about uh, when i was nine years old uh when i seen a about a five foot fall tall reptilian you know with the the type that you you see uh, we've seen lots of them and people giving testimony on them the big black almond eyes shaped eyes Big green head, small body compared in ratio compared to the humans, us humans, or uh, or the draconians for that matter. And that they, you know, not it wasn't one of the zeta gray looking uh, types, slick, sleek body. It was one of those other? Uh, well, there's so many different types of yeah. reptilians as there are humanoids, etc. Uh, and that memory, that was like so. That was uh, probably like you say, that was uh, uh, a reptilian coming and taking me for training. 
And in that case, there was a little bit of a glitch. So I got a, such a vivid look at them that I never forgot that memory. I kind of blocked it out for 10 years till I was about 20 years old. And, and then I uh, saw a television show actually with people. They showed a sort of a zetal reticula type uh, gray uh, uh, that people were claiming. And then this other type, two main types were in this show. And the other type was just like the one I seen. I go, oh, I see one of those, uh, those uh, reptilians. I see one of them, you know. So, but anyways, I just want to say one thing about that. When you see something like that, you don't, uh, I always knew, even as a kid, I don't care if anybody believes me or not or whatever, like, you, you know, you know what you see, right? So that was very vivid, uh, a memory that I never, uh, that never left me and it had a quite a zapping effect. The level of fear I remember experiencing from opening my eyes on the top, a uh, top, a uh, bunk bed, the top of a bunk bed and this reptilian three to four feet away and looking at me and, and looking pretty nasty too and stuff. Uh, as it turns out, I think from uh, some uh, excellent uh, information from you, yeah, that reptilian was just doing uh, his job, her job, uh, and wasn't necessarily, it like, came off as very nasty to a, you know, a nine-year-old human like me at the time, but they didn't, uh, uh, I don't, I don't remember and feel that that reptilian, that particular reptilian hurt me, just was doing a job, eh? Yeah, it was transporting you, taking you through energy portal, I feel, to the moon in their training base on the darker side of the moon where they psionically train uh, the kids to fight and also psionically wait to levitate and um, trigger your abilities to, be, to become a warrior. So you had reptilians around you and there was a different reptilian that was doing the training that was about seven feet tall from what I could pick up and their names start with J. It's interesting. So oh, a lot of their names start with J uh, yeah. apparently. Eh? Yeah, the one that cool. you and I looked at in the hypnosis, his name started with J. Um, so it, it's it's in the session recording. We're not going to mention their names and such, but they do oh, have yeah, exactly. a training base on the moon where they train uh, future SSP assets as mm -hmm. kids with the psionics and stuff, which Randy Kramer also mentioned that reptilians have incredible psionic abilities. So to see that in your session was interesting that you had been trained by them at that age. And then you were put into Dark Fleet Central Command uh, on their docking ports and stuff um, to maintain the the docking ports and the ships. Oh, right, right, yeah. Uh, because mm -hmm. you had memories of seeing ships coming and going and shuttlecraft. So we looked at that as well. And so we yeah, did... just Yeah, uh, well, just the, it was just that one brief memory so far of, like I say, I was definitely, we were definitely, there was five or six of us that had just ent uh, boarded a uh, ship and right away I knew this is a shuttle and we were, we're going somewhere and I knew for some reason I knew, you know, because like I say, the visual memory, these visual memories certainly I'm finding, uh, which is kind of groovy, come with these sort of energy information packets as well that aren't visual, but they're, they're enough information that they become visual in a sense. And then, you know, it's an ongoing unfolding thing, of course, um, uh, we can, you know, we can uh, open up these memories in ways, of course, meditation and such is very good. Uh, and then, uh, um, if we can, you know, like a, a hypno, some hypnotherapy sort of sessions like that session from you, like I say, that was very liberating to hear, uh, so much and it resonates and, you know, but I'll, I'll certainly put effort into remembering more, uh, if anything to email you and say, Oh, Eliana, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that thing you told me, you know what I mean? That's, that's what yeah. it's all about is, uh, continued expanding this thing. And, uh, and eventually we'll get to uh, more and more disclosure, all this. So, uh, but yeah, that was, I just had that brief memory of definitely in our, not navy blue, but uh, one piece, um, a little bit lighter than what we call navy blue around here, uniform. I knew we were in a dress uniform, you know what I mean? Like I wasn't, we weren't in our work dress. So we were boarding to go. And as far as I can, my memories are telling me, we were boarding to go from the moon to Mars. Probably, actually, when I finished my work on uh, the moon, that's and then I was we were, some of us were uh, we grabbed the shuttle to uh, to Mars, eh? Yeah, and you were doing maintenance of of the docking ports and just making sure 
uh, all the supplies were being put on the ships and the scheduling was done. Because you had asked me, one of the questions was, did I serve on any of the ships? And I said, no, you were actually maintaining the ships and the supplies and stuff. And then you asked, well, did I do any mining? And I said, you didn't do mining directly, but you were preparing the supplies to load on the ships for mining operations on the moon. Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, and uh, I had some more uh, just feelings and thoughts on that. Yeah, it looks like, um, I think perhaps, yeah, it was more just like, you know, base maintenance and uh, uh, port, uh, the port maintenance and operations uh, part of the crew. And uh, it seems to fit that there was definitely other more specialized, skilled people that would actually do more of the work on the ships, like the heavier, the refit, if you will, like we call it here, you know, when ships come into dry dock, you get the really excellent ship rights and uh, uh, mill rights and uh, welders and all kinds of, you know, really uh, to start, you know, doing the dance, eh? But then you got your sort of ma oper operations maintenance crew that, you know, you certainly do some lighter things than that, eh? Yeah, I mean, well, preparing schedules and preparing supplies for the ships and making sure the ships land in the correct port, that's important too because it has a maintenance schedule, making sure the ports themselves are in good working condition, kind of like um, quality control. That's what you were doing. Oh, absolutely. Like, and as far as that's a, yeah, uh, interesting you mentioned that because. I mean, basically, yeah, it's uh, it's a science to that. It's like I, uh, you go to a hospital around here, say the housekeeper at the hospital, as is we want to talk about importance, you know, the housekeeper at the hospital is as important as the doctor. And I'm saying that to me, there's a science on that because you take the housekeepers away from the hospital, we're going to have to shut that hospital down very quickly. Eh? That work needs to keep getting done or else it's going to uh, be, uh, we'll have to condemn the area, you know, due to uh, uh, some, uh, uh, it getting dirtier and dirtier yeah. and, and more and more, you know, I'm just saying, so that's absolutely, I mean, everybody's, all these occupations are uh, essential in uh, the, the overall machine uh, being able to continue to operate, absolutely. Yeah. So you were supporting staff for just quality control, maintenance, that stuff, just taking care of the day-to-day -day tasks that needed to be done to run the ports, the docking bays and to facilitate smooth coming in and going of ships because you said you remembered seeing different types of ships coming and going mm -hmm. as one of the memories so this is what mm -hmm. we looked at and we determined that it was at those docking ports uh, cool yeah and I, I would consider that a good gig because you're sort of like you're not any kind of leader or boss necessarily you don't have to take on a you know a lot of but you're, you've got to you're, you got to uh, take on a lot of responsibility in a sense, and you got to be on. You know, you push the button. You want to, you know you want to push the right button, and and yeah. you want to make sure something closed if it needs to be closed, or else yeah. something might flood out. Of course, but uh, it's a good gig in the sense of I think you're just in, you know, and then obviously we didn't have to you know fight and all that yeah. uh, in large part. We're just you know we're base maintenance, uh, re some light repairs, all that. So I I, I would uh, you know. I mean, that's kind of a good gig in the whole realm of things you're just you know you can be just sort of neutral and you got and yeah it's kind of uh it keeps your brain that, that kind of work can keep your brain fairly uh sharp hopefully because you're you know you got to be on too eh? yeah with what you're doing you're you're definitely uh, uh given responsibility for you know a lot of exp expensive equipment and such that uh you know you don't want to mess up uh uh for many reasons eh? Yeah, and surprisingly, that Central Command Dark Fleet Base, it had people of all nationalities on it, so it wasn't just Germans. Because when you think of Dark Fleet, people just automatically think it's German, but it was a mixture of all countries working on that base. Mm -hmm. So it's called Central Command, so um, it's a very specialized base, and it controls some of the mining rights on the moon, and explorations so it's interesting it has a specific function and it's not too far from that reptilian base where you were trained with the psionics oh exactly uh and it's definitely on the dark side of the moon and mm -hmm. it's like you say it, it's the dark fleet but not uh 
the uh, the base uh, that's basically just you know predominantly German. It's it's yeah. it's, it's, it's more of the you know uh, United Nations thing going on there. Mm-hmm. And I, I just wanted to mention it's interesting you mentioned. Uh, I want to see if I can remember this. Uh, uh, one of the ways they identified uh, each. Uh, the people from each country is uh, with a, a striping system, color and striping system on their lapels, uh, that kind of thing. Eh? Yeah, because when we looked at your uniform, it had stripes. It had red stripes. And you and I are in Canada, British Columbia. So our flag is the maple leaf. And also it has these, you have the maple leaf and you have two kind of red uh, stripes on the side of it and white background so that's our flag and you had the red stripes on your uniform you Ooh, like, yeah it was probably yeah exactly like you were i think you were saying it's, it was probably for the canadians it was probably you know white red white or something mm-hmm. eh? yes red, red in the middle and white and you know yes, that's kind of neat exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll strive to remember that too because we should be able to remember that uh, you know, that's pretty, uh, 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 you know, uh, vivid should be become, yeah. uh, we'll see if we can remember that one. Yeah, because it was, for us, looking at the identification system was interesting because everybody had different stripes for different countries based on what the flag is. So cool. that, because um, every nation has different flags and stuff in colors on the flag, some of it has stripes, some of it has coloring and stuff. So we identified uh, based on the uniform, uh, your Swiss Canadian. So cool, cool. Oh, also to the um, to sort of skip around just for a quick one, mm-hmm. if I may. Uh, as far as those pine forests, uh, it was kind of I found it kind of interesting. I, I don't want to you know name too many people because maybe they don't want to you know. Uh, I understand that, but uh, I just want to mention uh, the captain again, Captain Randy Kramer. Right after I had that uh, memory of the forest, the pine forest on Mars, I was listening to an interview with uh, Randy Kramer, and he mentioned uh, that he's seen photos of of pine or pine-like forests on Mars, eh? Uh, And it sounded like they're probably good quality photos, not those grainy ones they showed us on the surface. Here you go, you know. Uh, Although we're starting to get more some of the higher def now, we're you know. Uh, we're, we're starting to get some juicier looking uh, photos now uh, as, and films as time goes on. But uh, so that was kind of interesting. I found like, oh, wow, you know, uh, that, you know, like, uh, whereas the re- the draconians I seen, I had already heard that from Randy. So, you know what I mean? But in this case, I, I hadn't heard that. Although we, you know, I knew there was forests on there somehow anyways, and a lot of us do. And I've heard other testimonies. Uh, I still have a feeling there's some natural forests on Mars, but I'll have to strive to remember. And I heard a little testimony on uh, a couple of people figuring there's some, uh, you know, but we'll see how that goes. We'll, we'll keep remembering more now. Yeah, and remember when we were looking at the hypnosis memories of those pine forests that the insectoids, they're indifferent to the terraformation, so they don't mind those forests. Some of the reptilians that are used to the arid climate conditions that were opposed to it and trying to burn it down. That's why the Kruger soldiers were patrolling to protect those forests in the first place. Right. Uh, I'm just wondering too, it sounds like, you know, in some ways it it could be, you know, not very hard to, for them to, you know, uh, burn those forests down. Wouldn't it be by just, you know, uh, shooting some sort of projectiles at it uh, as well, but uh, you know, uh, somehow it looks like, you know, we've been able to hopefully have and protect them so they could yeah. uh, continue to grow and such, eh? Yeah, I mean, it required constant patrolling every day and night. So those forest sanctuaries couldn't be left alone because they're yeah. out in the open. The biodomes where it's in the controlled environment with the oxygen and all the forests and lakes, you know, everything is in closed off biodome. That's not patrolled because that's within the colonies. It's protected by electromagnetic shielding in the biodome, so it's mm. it, it's it's like um, you have kind of a natural environment within a biodome. So, but you can't just have biodomes everywhere. You have to have you have to have forests to reoxygenate the atmosphere and stuff. So they're trying these experiments with ten of these sanctuaries. What we could see in your hypnosis session so far. Mm, like a mm-hmm. slow terraformation process. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool to hear about that. And and from having, you know, vivid, a couple of vivid, uh, brief, but uh, memories of that. 
Um, and uh, the, because um, it was really, and then I think it sounds like these uh, pines up there was, uh, were uh, the DNA from pines here on earth were utilized for that. Yes. And, uh, you know, that makes sense too, because they're very, it was almost like a hybrid looking pine. I, I wouldn't call it a, a, a red pine or a scotch pine or a white pine, but perhaps a kind of a hybrid of that or, but definitely, you know, they're pine trees. Absolutely. You know, yeah. they're those, that groovy pine tree look uh, and that. Eh? Uh, so uh, definitely. Yeah. They, uh, like I said, that makes sense on another planet. They're going to grow um, perhaps uh, faster and larger and different depending on uh, the conditions of the planet. Yeah, something in the soil, on the Martian soil, where it just makes everything grow bigger. So we didn't really examine what specifically in the soil is just something to do with the soil. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Uh, we'll keep looking into that because, yeah, that, uh, you know, I, uh, that's another... I'm always uh, very interested in uh, the whole, uh, uh, you know, trees and stuff, man. The trees of life, all that. Absolutely, that's really cool to hear. And uh, that, uh, yeah, uh, if things continue to process now, we can really perhaps uh, increase the uh, terraforming uh, operations on Mars uh, in time, eh? Yeah. Uh, and that, eh? and restore uh, uh, another uh, brilliant planet, uh, you know eventually uh and it'll be able to uh support more and more life uh, absolutely the whole bit eh? yeah because when i was there with planetary corporations i remember the biodomes and that they have forests already and lakes in the biodomes so oh, uh, oh yeah exactly yeah. yeah exactly so and you also had a recent memory of something that you wanted to share oh yeah exactly um uh, and then I have a, uh, maybe I can mention a little more about the draconian uh, memories too. After. Sure. But uh, this recent memory, yeah, this one, um, I, I don't think I've heard this yet, but what I had a memory of three or four days ago was um, what I could describe as a, uh, definitely a, from the cat family, um, a very strong looking, but not large, like uh, I could compare this to a, um, like from the, uh, say it was strong like leopards are here on earth, but it was fast like the cheetahs are. You know, the cheetahs aren't as, as muscular and strong as the leopards, uh, but they're super fast, right? Cheetahs can run, you know, 60, 70 miles an hour. So this, and this was a, a sleek, muscular, but very sleek, fast uh, cat, definitely from the cat family, uh much like a uh the leopards we see here and the, the cheetahs and that from that family not spots so it was a, a darker beigeous color with sort of black stripes not not spots on it uh but very strong that's what i remember about it uh and not large but strong and fast like they had everything going for it you know it's kind of like the uh it had what the cheetah has in speed and the strength uh, that the uh leopard has and it pounced on an insect, insectoid type creature. I didn't get a good vivid look at the insect, but it was definitely an insectoid and a, a reasonably large one. Uh, like um, uh, we'd be talking approximately that insectoid had to be two and a half, three feet long and and like about a foot and a half at least, you know, tall and that kind of thing. So, you know, this massive insect for what, uh, you know, I'm, we're, we'd be used to seeing here on Earth. But apparently there are some really large insects uh, on Mars, insectoids of all sorts. Eh? So you saw the cheetah like being um, attacking the insectoid? Yeah, it, 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 and it, it like I say, just, yeah. Uh, and not really a cheetah, but just this slick looking panther almost too like almost like a if i had call it anything it was like a hybrid a leopard panther uh you know but it was definitely a cat like in a magnificent not super large like uh maybe as large as you're a full-grown uh cheetah here at the most but very muscular like very you could tell it really strong pounced on that insectoid yeah like you know it's hunting eh? and uh so yeah the cats uh you know they uh they uh, make a living uh uh, including on uh, eating uh, some of the insectoids there, uh, absolutely. So there's definitely cats there as far as I can see. That's the only memory I've got so far. These really strong, fast uh, uh, cats that are, yeah, I would almost, uh, like I say, it was a, a darker medium to dark, nice beige brown color with 
not spots, but some black stripes definitely too, right? Going so, on there. And that's on Mars, you think? Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. I just knew it was on Mars, you know what I mean? It's not like the landscapes, because I these memories so far are very uh, uh, focused on a, a, a not a large frame, uh, like a large uh, frame where I'm seeing a lot of uh, landscape around me and everything, including with, with the draconians. I just had a, it was me and another draconian, whereas I sensed I'm in the field, there's other people around, there's other humans, there's other draconians, but it was like that kind of memory, like a tunnel memory almost. Uh, and so uh, I'll, I'll strive to expand on these things and others to get a maybe a wider uh, lens of uh that the environments uh, that these memories are taking place in yeah and what's the draconian memories because you wanted to expand on that a little bit oh yeah that uh the other memory i had was the one like i mentioned of uh uh engaging with a uh a draconian and with a plasma sword and the other one was i uh i had a dagger 10 inches at least a large dagger to maybe even a foot long and i remember Pierce, being able to get uh, Pierce the left hand, lower left hand neck of the rep, uh, the draconian and uh, just sort of piercing the skin. And it made me think after, yeah, that's, uh, that, that dagger we use must, it's, it's, uh, to me, it's got to be uh, uh, coated with some kind of probably neurotoxin, fast acting neurotoxin, because we're not going to, tough scaly skin. And of course, they, 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 they wear, you know, uh, combat uh, uh, gear to uh, to some extent, uh, or you know, depending. Uh, I'll have to remember more about what their uh, their actual uh, combat, uh, other than you know what, what they have on for clothing and stuff. But uh, so it's. It, I think that's what that's all about. Is as long as you can pierce in, so the neurotoxin will get in there. Because I can't see how we use it for, you know, stabbing, like, you know, yeah. uh, goes on uh, with human, you know, like using it to actually penetrate fairly deep. Uh, that way, it's more like pierce, get below the skin so the uh, neurotoxin could be uh, yeah. unleashed uh, on the uh, on the opponent, on the the, the enemy, whatever. It, yeah. Uh, the the combat combatant. Because reptilians are very tough, muscular, and strong, so taking them out physically is not that easy. Exactly. So it would have to like pierce the skin, send in the neurotoxin and drop the combatant. Yeah, exactly. I, I can't see that that weapon is used as like I say for what it's used, what humans on humans use it for and stuff in, in a sense. Yeah. Uh, whereas, yeah, exactly that, uh, uh, you know, that coding thing. And um, well, yeah, they're definitely a lot stronger than uh, us humans. Pound for, pound for pound, I would uh, propose a reptilian is stronger than a human, pound for pound, just generally speaking. And certainly these draconians are a lot stronger than we are. But with our technology, our uh, combat exosuits and our weaponry, and, you know, it's uh, we want to talk about weapons. Uh, it's the mind is, is of course, the big weapon. Eh? So uh, yes. the humans, that's my feeling. And, and what I've heard uh, from others is, uh, yeah, we, we've done quite well combating against draconians they're physically stronger and they're very fierce and tough and skilled and strong i got a lot of respect for them for that stuff but the humans too like you know what i mean i have no uh uh as far as battling uh i'm i'd be i'm just as concerned about humans than the the, the reptilians uh, the draconians the humans you know humans are warriors too obviously and and you know so you know what i mean like uh, uh because you know the mind and all that yeah so uh uh, but yeah, you know, physical strength is, is an attribute and a, can be an advantage, of course, power, you know, all that. Uh, but it's, there's many uh, aspects involved to uh, uh, maybe uh, being able to win a battle, of course. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and your first encounter with reptilians was the psionic training, the levitation, the um, moving energetically to... Um, kind of combat the physical reptilian coming at you, like with the psionics with your mind when they were training you on the dark side of the moon, the reptilian base, to use your psionics to move quicker and faster, to get out of the reptilian's way, not to be hit by the reptilian. So to use the mind as the power to levitate and to, for that speed. So that was interesting seeing that training that you received and it was physical 
fighting training with the psionics, with these reptilians. So it was preparing you for the Mars environment, for the tougher combat experiences that you would later on have on Mars. Yeah, that was really cool to hear that stuff too, uh, Ileana. Of, uh, yeah, I hadn't really thought of the fact that it looks like, yeah, the humans are trained more extensively than what I would have guessed uh, in psionics abilities, like you say, for, and it's, you know, uh, of course, uh, that's, yeah, that's the way to fly. Uh, eventually, uh, we'll get that in the schools here, uh, right from kindergarten, we'll start teaching everybody psionics, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we can really, everybody can really have an opportunity to, to develop that. These are real powers, real skills, uh, and uh, especially when we use them in a positive uh, way to protect ourselves our, uh, our, and others and our uh, civilization and beyond in general, you know, to do good works or whatever. That's up to the individual and the groups. But uh, and I, cool to hear because uh, there's, um, uh, like you say, yeah, the, I have a feeling these, I haven't got a lot of memories yet of this, but yeah, the reptilians, including the local Mars reptilians, uh, are very tend uh, have some very uh, uh, advanced, uh, very uh, developed uh, psionics abilities for sure, eh? Yeah, and, and you have a background. You were in the Canadian Forces or something? Uh, I well, yeah, I spent a couple of years in the Canadian Navy in the 1980s. Uh, I got in a fair bit of trouble for being late for work and stuff. Uh, I had a couple of years. It was, you know. Uh, I certainly have no regrets and never had an ax to grind, but yeah, I was, didn't really, um, and I, 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 uh, I gotta say that I, I, I respect people who can sort of be good in the military at things and also be able to stay out of trouble. I, that's, that's a sort of an intelligence that maybe a guy like me, I should work on. Eh? Uh, I like, uh, I, and let me, can, I just like to mention one more, uh, uh, uh soldier, a scientist guy who's worked and gave great testimonies, uh, Emery Smith, I think of as an example, of, like he did so well in the regular sort of military in the, uh, uh, in the United States Air Force that he was so, you know, he did so well as a service man uh, that, you know, and he, you know, his intelligence, his hard work, he, he was offered more opportunities, obviously, and what he did. So that's, that's an example of, you know, and hats off to, uh, including my friends, uh, a couple of my friends who did full careers, you know, they uh, they did the dance. So I really respect the, uh, that kind of those types of military personnel that uh, they can do the whole dance that way. And so, but that was a good experience. Yeah, I uh, you know I did a lot, some good traveling and best buddies, brothers to this day. You know, I go like uh, we talk about time. I just want to mention about time, if I may, quickly. Mm -hmm. I went like the last time I went over to my buddies, uh, who's you know hangs out in his barn a lot. Uh, I knew him in the navy. And then he went army. So he was hard army for most of his career, but he was Navy when I knew him. I worked with him on the ship. Awesome guy. He's a brother. He's, he's a beautiful uh, uh, spirit. And uh, uh, he was, I think he's a combat veteran too, a decorated combat veteran. He went in the army and over in Bosnia and all this. But we talked for eight hours the other day, or it was a little while ago, like we've done this before. Eight hours goes by like, it's like we're just beginning, you know? It's like, wow, man, uh, you know? So uh, that's cool. It's like, wh what is time anyways, eh? When you're yeah. around your brother like that and we're talking to each other back and forth, uh, you don't need water, you don't need food, man. You don't need anything. You're just, you know, you're just doing the dance and we're helping each other too, eh? Yeah. We're helping each other. Uh, we're kind of like, uh, we're good for each other. You know, we have positive effects on each other and uh, we love each other, you know what I mean? And, yeah. we got, and uh, so that's cool, eh? The brotherhood, the sisterhood. Uh, yeah. bonds that are done uh, that's the, the that's the juice eh? that's the uh yeah. wow that's the gifts and everything so i had a yeah two years very uh appreciate all the experiences including i ended up in the federal military stockade near the end for i showed up on duty uh i started cracking jokes i was drunk and after that i had a few late charges before then a eh? like uh, a drift as they call it in the navy a wall so i went to edmonton for i got a 60-day sentence marched hard got out in 46 and that was like, uh, I take that as some sort of specialized training, got to march with the best. Like it was mostly hard army, hard uh, Navy personnel in there, not much Air Force. And so I got to march with uh, the hard, hardcore soldiers and, and, and uh, lots of Navy and uh, including Canadian Airborne Regiment commandos, uh, Van Dues, PPCLI, um, uh, Royal, Canadian, Royal Canadian Artillery, et cetera. 
So that was quite an experience. Like, yeah, that's, uh, you know, uh, but yeah, it was um, uh, very, uh, you know, military experience is, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of good training. It can, it can help you a lot to sort of, you know, it helped me, uh, you know, that, that was, it actually helped me to finally say, oh yeah, maybe I shouldn't be late for work, eh? And that was in 1986? Uh, I got out in 86. Yeah, I got it. I started in 84 Cornwallis. Um, and then, you know, went to Halifax for a while, fleet school and stuff. We went into the tattoo show, uh, the Navy tattoo show. And we, there's always Marines, U.S. Marines that come to that and do a performance in that too, eh? The Canadian tat Navy tattoo. So the Marines were there. That was cool uh, being in the Navy tattoo that year where the, the, the Navy uh does various performances including the gun run and you know the the pretty uh the, the well-known gun run that navies do uh some navies do anyways yeah. and then went to the west coast yeah attached to a ship on the west coast for uh you know the the, the 18 months after the first six months on the east coast uh so yeah that was uh uh you know really helped me a lot including to finally see oh yeah maybe i shouldn't be late for work eh? Yeah, um, I just wanted to kind of share your military experiences as well on Earth. And cool, because so. oh, it's, yeah, Eliana also too. Uh, because uh, yeah, so yeah, and yeah, you know, Eliana, yeah, it's uh, um, I mean, I was fortunate, yeah, a couple of years I didn't have to do any combat or anything, and you know, because I think I'm thinking about it too. I feel my heart and soul feels okay, even though I've been in combat with uh. Or from what my memories are telling me with draconians, etc. Yeah. Uh, and you know, like uh, I think it's starting to happen where the veterans here, that you know, humans on humans here on the surface, that may be uh, taxing more in some ways because it's your own people, really. You know, uh, it, yeah. that should. I'm not saying that that's necessarily it, but I was listening to a Vietnam veteran last night. It's a great, some great uh, testimonies he gives, and with this lady and everything. And his experience over the years, he's 70 years old now. Amazing. He's really able to speak about his his combat experiences very vividly and openly. And you can see the healing that's gone over the years. It's awesome. So there is a way I think we can offer more and more our people so they can heal and recover uh, yeah. from PTSD and uh, all the stress uh, and strain and yeah. trauma, trauma that comes with... Uh, uh, being in the military, uh, uh, especially, of course, the con well, uh, more, uh, the combat soldiers, more than yeah. anything, of course, experiencing and, that kind of thing. Yeah, and we, when we looked through your hypnosis memories, we didn't find that you were a slave or you felt like a slave. It was like you did your work, you did your mission, and you were part of different teams. So it was very structured and military-like, but it wasn't Nothing like what Tony Rodriguez went through, where he was a slave, literally. Oh, I, yeah, I've listened to Tony, uh, and I, I, I really appreciate all Tony's works and testimonies. And yeah, that's like, wow. Yeah, exactly. Tony's experience, uh, and then you're getting, we're getting into the really ugly, nastiest stuff going. Uh, you know, I, I mean, there's, to me, there, it's, it's easy to see. Uh, of the most heinous criminals uh, in this whole galaxy are here, have been here. And, you know, we're starting to clean it up now, but it's yeah. it's going to take a while and it is taking a while. Yeah, Tony, uh, awesome. Uh, you know, I really appreciate his testimonies. And like you say, yeah, he's got a very unique, uh, powerful, uh, like, uh, amazing, like uh, stories uh, of his experiences. You know, but I, I want to say one more thing, too, about the, the few people I've heard that are, uh, 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 space program veterans, if you will, and not just the space program veterans, but you know, it seems like in large part everybody's got big hearts still, like you too, Eliana. You know, Emery Smith and Randy Kramer and uh, uh, uh Jason Rice and uh, uh, Tony Rodriguez, etc. Big hearts still and souls. So, yeah, we don't have to lose our heart and soul, it's what's in our heart, eh? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, when we're on the combat field, if we choose to sort of go into a become a psychopath and just hate, hate, hate completely and, you know, and really not really care about have any care and concern again. So say la vie. But uh, it's our We don't have to necessarily like it. There's a lot going on. But yeah. that's what I'm uh, feeling from it. Yeah. Still got your heart and soul, man. That's, yeah, exactly. That's, like, uh, that's the juice. That's who we are, man. Eh? Yeah. And the experiences, what happened to us in the SSP do not define us per se on earth because we 
that stuff happened. We did, I think you did a 20 and back and I did a 60 and back. So, but that does not define us who we are as decent human beings with hearts here on earth. Absolutely. Yeah. And actually, I think from what you were uh, saying to me, you figured I actually did 30, 10 yeah. on Mars or sorry, yeah. 10 on the moon 10, 30, uh, yes. at the, the Dark Fleet uh, base, uh, command center, uh, yeah, Central Dark Fleet command. base. Central Command, yeah, with yeah. the sort of unite uh, lots of people from many nations in that. Eh? Yeah. Uh, ten years there, uh, yes. maintenance, you know, and then yes. twenty years on Mars. Ten years, then yes. ten years on Mars. Uh, ten years Kruger and ten years Mars Defense Force. Exactly, uh, so like a part of uh, protecting the force mm -hmm. for ten years, and then sent up north after that as Mars mm -hmm. Defense Force, uh, yes. uh, help maintaining, protecting, uh, securing uh, the base. And uh, yeah. surrounding areas, yeah. uh, the uh, uh, yes, yeah, still thirty and back. Yeah, the grid, uh, like, and so that was it. Like, I just want to say one thing that, uh, and I think I'll probably remember this. That it makes sense. The timeline makes sense that I was up north when the captain was up north for uh, some of his years, and I think I met him, but I don't remember. Like, you know, because I have I've had the pleasure of meeting Captain Randy Kramer. Uh, I went. Uh, I was able to go to his psionics class, weekend psionics class, which was like mind blowing, awesome uh, in many ways. And uh, so, but I'll see if I remember that. It was one of those things when I actually met Randy in person. It's like, hey, you know, you, you think you know, I know this guy or whatever, eh, or something. Mm -hmm. But that may not be it. But uh, definitely, the timeline looks like I was up north some of the years Randy was. He was probably up north, and then I think he, like, he did really well and became a pilot and all that, eh? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, eh? Like, these, some of the, like, uh, some of the, the testimony given by some of these uh, veterans already, uh, we're looking at very high achievers here. You know, certainly the captain and uh, Emery Smith, you're like, very high achievers, eh? That's, uh, yeah. you know, these are very uh, excellent uh, um, uh, serv uh, servicemen. They're reminding me of scientists slash soldiers types you know they're soldiers but they're these brilliant kind of scientists yeah. uh mm -hmm. as well it's a, it's a really cool thing and and some people are taken into ssp service not just because they were military or it's just something they have with their mind their abilities so it's not just navy military army it could be people that are just have certain types of psionic abilities or stuff that they do so that's why they get taken into these programs. So it's not always uh, military people. It could be scientists. It could just be people with specialized um, abilities, just something characteristics that these programs can use in, in their training and services. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. There's so many specialties. Yeah. You need to, to get these machines going. Yeah. You need so much skills development like i worked in the film business for about five years as a background performer and being ex-military you get some good gigs you get to have fun working on swat teams with other uh mostly ex-army guys but you know there's ex navy too and uh that's that's a lot of fun with these kind of crazy young veterans like really good tend to be really good people though and you know uh kind of thing you, you can have a lot of fun but it's the same idea that when you know to make a film all the skills and effort and work that goes into making a film uh, you know, that kind of thing. Absolutely. That's what it takes. Eh? You know, lots of skill, lots of uh, knowledge, lots of, uh, and of course, our creative minds, uh, the creative yeah. juices, get them flowing to really maybe uh, have a, be able to make something special and uh, all really even brilliant at times or something. Eh? Well, I mean, and there's so much disclosure in uh, shows and films like Stargate SG-1, um, how they go on different planets through the portals that reminds me of the SSP, even some of the weapons, uh, semi-automatics, that reminds me of, of what we have on Mars, except it's plasma rifles. So, oh, yeah, exactly. You know, it, there's a lot of disclosure in the film industries, shows and movies, and video games too. So um, Absolutely. the sci-fi components, that's part of the SSP stuff, a lot of it, and you and you watch them, you, you think, oh, that's similar to some of my memories. Um, and we're not, yeah. we're, we're not taking anything elements from these shows. It's just sometimes 
like, you know, we've had our memories before even watching any of those shows, but it's like comparison. It's like, ah, well, we've, there's a comparable in what soft disclosure in these shows to what our memories are. And Absolutely. most people call it science fiction, but um, art really imitates life and life mm -hmm. imitates art. So there's very close ties to that, I find, so. Just yeah, me too. Uh, and like one, uh, what some of us uh, figure are, is an excellent source uh, is uh, I heard uh, I heard the gentleman say uh, the Star Wars films. Uh, of course, we think of them as science fiction. And uh, Buddy says when in uh, in you know in point of fact, this are the Star Wars films are science documentaries. It's like ah, oh, right on, yeah. man. Yeah, you yeah. know, kind of thing. Eh? Oh, indeed. And, uh, Oh yeah, and Stargate SG One uh, as a, a background extra, I got to work on that show, and uh, one app, one episode in particular, got into about three scenes, got a real juicy role. Uh, you know, as an extra, you get in three scenes, and you're actually spending more than three or four seconds on on uh, in the frame. You're you're actually showing up and stuff, and that was neat. Playing like a space uh, soldier, not really soldier. We were like security. Uh, one of the principal actors, we were uh the security to you know when we arrest we arrested them and stuff eh? and uh actually i did, i got to do an action scene there because somebody didn't show up and they let me say how about you you want to you know so i got to you know arrest and and zip lock and pull up uh, the principal actor guy we were arresting at the time but yeah that exactly from working on the film business including lots of sci-fi stargate sg1 uh stargate atlantis uh, uh others and some of the films Exactly. I had to give me feelings like when they replicate or, or make it, we're supposed to be a, a starship. It could be sometimes it'd be a bridge or just mm -hmm. part of a ship down the flats and stuff. They make it look, I'd get feelings from that, you know, uh, for sure. I did had no memories, but they're kind of precursors to what can become memories. Yeah, I know what you mean. You, you, you know, it's, you resonate with that stuff. Eh? It's like, wow, man, you know, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Helps you remember probably, uh, no doubt, you know. Stuff, oh, eh? Yeah, I mean, I, I try my best not to watch any shows, not to get any biofeedback where there could be misunderstanding what's my real memories and what's part of these shows. So I try not to watch anything. When mm -hmm. I do memory recalls, it, it's point blank. I don't refer to any shows, anything. It, it literally, in my self-hypnosis, because I started off with self-hypnosis, Mm -hmm. gaining my memories I never watched any of these shows so actually I started watching Stargate SG-1 in Atlantis after the hypnosis stuff so it it did trigger feelings and it did trigger sensations but my memories were separate because they weren't like in Stargate SG-1 or Atlantis so just kind of like, I always tried to have a blank slate, a blank mind. And when we were doing hypnosis for me, remember how I said, calm your mind, just have everything, like nothing in your mind, a clean slate. Um, so you can access your memories. So that's what I always tell everybody in hypnosis. You need to have a calm, clear mind in order to access these memories and walk through them and look at them. So you and I kind of did a breathing exercise. We went and like cleared your mind. We, you were in a light trance, but you were very cognizant of everything you were experiencing, right? So you were fully present there with me looking at these memories. Absolutely. It was kind of like, yeah, that really helps keeping my eyes closed. And then the beginning of the session, you uh, sort of put us through some good, you know, get the breathing and get calm mm -hmm. and, uh, and exactly that really very helpful. And that, I mean, that's blowing my mind that someone has psionics ability like that. And it's resonating that this is authentic and everything. But like I say, I'll work on getting more memories back. And at least you know, I want to email you and say, Hey, you know, Ileana, I remember what you say. That's, you know, that, you know, because I want to, I want to verify that just whatever. Well, it's good. We're at that point now. I think more of us, more and more of us will uh, remember more uh, memories. Yeah. But I could see for you, yeah, the work you do, well, all kinds of groovy work. Uh, yeah, you want to, like you say, you know, you, you, I guess you want to be quite careful in 
perhaps not being influenced from watching, you know, sci-fi or whatever, yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Uh, exterior stuff, uh, that kind of thing. Absolutely. Eh? Yeah. And I always tell people, um, they, they, they have a connection. Some people, th oh yeah, my memories are similar to this show and this show. And I always say, try to be very clear about making sure it's your own memories, that it comes from your connections to your soul, to your memories, not from these shows. So try not to compare things left and right. And you aren't comparing anything. We didn't start off talking about Stargate SG-1 and that you had been an extra on that. We started with your memories. And mm -hmm. then we talked about a little about Stargate SG-1. I actually forgot that you had been an extra actor on that show. I was just kind of doing an example comparison. So it was interesting to get your take on being an extra on a show like that. So, oh yeah, I think I might actually mention that that particular show. Like, uh, yeah, uh, right, maybe perhaps even. But that's interesting. You mentioned it in this session. I find yeah. that too. Uh, these, you know. These uh, when things sort of resonate and connect, uh, we connect in ways, uh, various levels and these vibrations yeah. and types of waves and all this. Uh, it's cool. I really appreciate just people speaking out more and more. And uh, we're really uh, some really juicy stuff. And yeah, just for uh, we can continue to, uh, you know, take it with a grain of salt, of course, all that stuff. Like, you know, because there's a uh, this whole thing, you know, what I mean, I it's like a. a it's like, say, Tony Rodriguez or some of these people giving all these testimony over years now. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, anyways, I, I, I should, I, it's touchy subjects, but um, uh, in a sense, yeah, I, I really don't care if anybody doesn't believe me or not. Same yeah, with the I, reptilian experience. You know what I mean? Because, and that's the way you, you need to be, I think, or you, whatever. If you're going to talk about this stuff in a matrix like this, Although it's really opening up now, I believe it's more and more people will be giving testimony. That you yeah. got to realize, yeah, you know, say, oh, you're a crazy uh, lion, snake, whatever. Eh? Like, who cares? You know what I mean? No, I don't, don't care, care either. I don't. I really don't care in yeah. that regard. Eh? I'm focused more and more on helping with disclosure and yeah. uh, more and more on just generally po uh, staying. It's uh, staying in a more positive frame because that's we're able to vibrate at higher frequencies then. And that's a lot of uh, can help protect ourselves and others that way. If we're, yeah. you know, I, I'm noticing it more and more. You're, you get less involved in heavier density experiences with others and everything like back and forth, you know, insulting each other, whatever. The more you sort of vibrate, you can sort of, you know, be less and less in bondage with that heavier uh, re uh, sub reality, if you will. Yeah, right? exactly. And, and, I mean, your memories were very different from other folks who had been on Mars and stuff. You were the first to really have a memory of those forests and stuff. So that was unique to me uh, because I had heard that there's, they're trying to terraform Mars, but I didn't have any uh, direct information about somebody having memories of that. So that was interesting. That was what caught my attention in your hypnosis session like delving into that and exploring that. So that cool. was quite special for me. And I, I'm glad we got to discuss it today and some of your ex other experiences. Oh, cool. Cool. That's yeah. a, that's a, you know, uh, thanks for uh, having me on your show and all that. Eh? Uh, how long did you want to go, Adrian, uh, uh, Ileana, on I, this? I think we're pretty good. I think we discussed quite, quite a bit. So I'm very Absolutely. happy with what, what we discussed right now. So I thank you so much for being on the show and I appreciate you coming i mean you're local you and i are you're richmond i'm sorry so oh yeah yeah but exactly we, yeah we did this through zoom so online but it works the same way as if it would have been in person to me oh, it works yeah. the same way exactly uh there's a couple of little things if i could mention eliana about yeah. energy yes if, if, sure. if like I'll, I'll try I'll, I'll strive to be quicker sure. but a couple of unique experiences i've had in recent years and one was listening to um, Randy Wiedenheimer. And I appreciate, I really uh, like that interview you and Randy did uh, not long ago. It was, that was cool. It's, that's cool, really cool stuff. It's helping uh, anybody who uh, wants to listen to that stuff. But uh, I heard Randy one time, not so long ago, and it wasn't, I, I wasn't there live or anything, uh, but you know, he was with uh, uh, Emery, Big Emery Smith. You know, the big soldier, he's on the stage, uh, standing at ease. And, and when the time when Randy was talking at one point, Randy spoke, to make a long story short, Randy Wiedenheimer spoke of 
the genocide of the Native Americans, basically, and that the, sh the, the population reduction massive. Yeah. And, and I felt that energy uh, like, wow, that was a powerful, heavy energy I felt coming. And it was just, it wasn't a lot. I wasn't in the same room listening to Randy live, but that was a heavy, powerful energy I could feel when Randy was explaining, you know, uh, about really what's been genocide and is genocide. And I just want to mention, because the Canadian government officially has recognized the Native Americans, certainly the, they're specifically, we're speaking of the ones living on what's known as Canada as an actual genocide. So even our government here has officially recognized that as a genocide. But I just want to mention that I felt this energy. That's the first time from listening, you know, a film, that kind of energy coming. It's like, wow, heavy, man, not, you know, unpleasant. But, you know, Randy's a very powerful guy, obviously. And uh, one more quick one, if I may, I had an experience with Oliver Stone. I went to uh, downtown to uh, UBC Film School. They got a really beautiful little theater down there, downtown uh, on uh, Hastings Street, downtown east side, mm -hmm. Gastown area. To make all, uh, but just so it was lit so everybody could see each other, the audience and the people on the stage. But at one point, our eyes met with all I uh, my eyes and met with Oliver Stones and we could all see each other like I say the way this the, this uh, theater was lit uh, softly lit but lit bright enough and I noticed this flashing right when our eyes met these uh, star flashing white lights coming from his eyes and uh, it was like I, I had never experienced that in it with another human and of course uh, Oliver Stones uh, you know uh, uh, two tours in Vietnam combat veteran brilliant filmmaker I uh, really, uh, I think uh, uh, the veterans who can watch that stuff, uh, you know, Platoon, uh, those movies start to come out with some, give a lot more dynamics and uh, to uh, the soldier, not these sort of just propaganda old, you know, John Wayne movies or whatever. I think that's helpful. Eh? And so if any, I just wanted to say if any veterans are ready, uh, I would say, you know, uh, watch The Punisher. The, the show called The Punisher, there's two seasons. It's heavy, violent, but I think that could help a lot of veterans. Uh, you know, not, uh, if we're ready, uh, maybe we don't want to see that. And uh, also, uh, if anybody hasn't watched Altered Carbon, the two seasons of Altered Carbon, uh, another Netflix original, uh, so a lot of uh, disclosure in there. Uh, yeah. And I find that, a, you know, it's another film is taking another step up with the, uh, it's getting better uh, with uh, the technologies, the CGI and everything. Uh, stuff like that. Eh? Yeah, well, I felt the first season of Altered Carbon was kind of like my experiences on Mars with the stacks and the sleeves, you know, how how that um, device holds the soul of the person. Uh, the stack, that's the stack the device, and it's put through the neck, the back of the neck, into the sleeve, which is the body. It's the DNA copy of their original body, as close as they can make it. And, you know, uh, the stack powers the sleeve and the body can be recloned over and over as long as the DNA is the same sequence, so the original copy. So that was interesting. Unfortunately, it got cancelled. It only had two seasons, but it was a good show. It really, and it can take on, like, the, the, the stack of the, of the memories of the soul, it could be in, implanted in any body. It doesn't have to be even your own carbon copy. It could be any other body that you can end up in on any other planet. So that show is very interesting because the soul can travel from body to body as long as the stack is there. So. See, awesome. I wanted to mention Altered Carbon uh, to you. Yeah, and I appreciate your uh, what you just said. Yeah, right on, uh, uh, Ileana, uh, with the, all the work you do and, and such, eh? Uh, including, you know, like really like uh, you're, uh, I would say, uh, I don't want to put labels on anybody, but as I could say, you're like, uh, to me, you're like a cosmic grade shamanistic, you know, uh, counselor, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Like, uh, you know, you, and you've studied a lot of stuff. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm a professional counselor. I can say, you know, I went to, uh, and it became, you know, I haven't worked, I don't work at it to get paid, but, uh, you know, downtown and having coffees with uh, the brothers and sisters, we help each other. Eh? Uh, yeah. We help, we can find ways to help each other uh mm -hmm. and stuff eh? and uh yeah. you know there's so many great leaders and everything around like my uh my buddy downtown lived in a room for 45 years two tours in vietnam combat veteran and i just want to mention something he was like he's went through so much but he's doing great he's strong he's a, you know a 70 year old guy and uh, he's continuing to heal and we can find 
it'll, I look forward to us having more and more to offer the people in, far, in regards yeah. to healing centers and medicines yeah. and technologies yeah. and ide philosophies and ideologies, eh? high psychologies. And my buddy, though, what a great leader, staff sergeant, highly decorated. You know, we need guys like that uh, in leadership roles. Uh, you know, he's hanging out in a room for 45 years down in his hooch, as he calls it. Uh, and what a great leader and a strong and such big hearted guy. And like I say, I just got to become his friend. I remember him saying one day, so, uh, or after we became friends, he goes, well, I only, uh, I only, uh, I'm only friends with veterans. You don't have to be a combat veteran necessarily, but I remember him, um, I, I, he might've said that before we became friends even, but I pulled up my shirt with my anchor on it one day and go, Hey, Al, look at this, man. I'm a veteran, man. Uh, I did a little stint in the Navy, and then he says, oh, I didn't know that. And then after that, we started hanging around, coffees, yeah. playing pool. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah. but Al, yeah, I'm not yeah, – like, uh, wow. You know, so that, that literally, because uh, uh, being a veteran, I got to uh, – that got me an in, so to speak, and yeah. became uh, – hung around uh, this awesome, uh, uh, highly decorated combat veteran – who's like, you know, a big brother, an uncle to me and uh, got to hang around him for like many years. But I think he finally got a little bit of help and better housing now. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I'm just wondering, why aren't we helping, especially these combat veterans uh, living in a hooch for, you know, a, a little room for uh, 45 years? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't even have uh, some housing for a guy like that, some nice housing off him. But uh, yeah, he eventually finally got some better housing. I haven't seen him for a yeah. while. Like, so that's good, yeah. But, you know, yeah. you carry on. No use yeah. playing victim. You know what I mean? No. For any of us, eh? No. It is what it is. Uh, yeah. It's highly illegal what they do to us, uh, put a, uh, drafting us into the Space Force. But as a per my personal view is different from the big view of, yeah, we want to make this much more legal and transparent and offer uh, openly people opportunities. We can yeah. really tap into the wealth of our uh, people and the skills. Yeah. I mean, Offering it, be transparent. So you want to go work off planet? Uh, we got some mining jobs over in the, that asteroid, up in the asteroid belt if you're interested, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know, various jobs. It'll yeah. get there. That, that, that's going to happen uh, step by step, uh, well, I would, uh, I would uh, propose. Yeah, eventually it can't be called the secret space program because... Eventually, all secrets come out, but I guess in the meantime, we're trying to sort out our memories and experiences. Some of us can do it on our own through meditation. Some of us do it through self-hypnosis, and some of us just get together and explore doing hypnosis like you and I did for your session, and it's individualistic to every person, so, but again, you know, oh, we'll yeah. do the best we can. So I thank you so much for being on the show today. Okay. Thank you, Ileana. And, uh, well, I'll definitely be in touch. Hey, thanks for your help, uh, uh, including that session the other day. Eh? Yeah. I, I'm very interesting session and I got to learn something new about Mars from you. From your okay, cool. And uh, yeah, I'll definitely eventually, uh, I'll invite you on my show. Uh, and if you go or not, that's, uh, that's not, I understand either way, but I'll certainly invite you on my show, Cosmic Howling Media, uh, soon and like I say, whether if you don't if you don't feel it's right to go on, we don't go on. Of course, like yeah, we gotta be. Let's be ourselves. Be who we are, eh? Uh, yeah. You know and stuff, and 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 keep rising out of this three D mentality where you know ah, you know all that. Eh? Uh, let's not, uh, uh, you know, let's uh, we, and that's what's happening. Yeah, absolutely, expanding our minds. Uh, and it's thanks to great uh, testimonies more and more online, uh, including from Seat Space Program veterans, stuff like that. Eh? Yeah, exactly. uh, MK Ultra Mind Control Veterans. I just want to say one thing about uh, hats off to Kathy O'Brien, one of the toughest light warriors walking the earth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the warriors are male and female, obviously. Yes. You know, yeah. and that's the thing, eh? The the females are in some ways better warrior, whatever. Like, but well, yeah, it's, it's in the mind, eh? It's it, our mind is the weapon, the big we're, weapon. Eh? If, we're if, all uh, equal. So it's yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, yeah, let's. We got That's what we got to get back to here. Is a really truly uh equality egality yeah. pour tous as the french say you know yeah. and we'll get there uh, restore yeah. natural law all that uh yes. where it's really starting to, uh things are really moving faster and faster right eh? yeah okay well thank you for coming on this show and i appreciate it and i hope you have a good day okay thank you too eliana uh, yeah best wishes and uh, hopefully see you soon eh yes okay cool bye